Well, welcome Bayside. Come on, church. Let's connect with everybody at all the campus. Welcome. No matter what campus you're in, no matter where you're watching, we are one body, different locations. What an honor it is. I know as we praise the Lord together, to, to, uh, together at all the campuses or on demand, jails, penitentiaries, on demand, wherever it is, I pray you'll feel the warmth of God's people worshiping the Lord and you'll get encouraged today as we open his word. My name is David Murphy. If I haven't met you yet, my name is David Murphy. I get the privilege to serve here at Bayside under the leadership of Pastor Rod and Amy. And it's such an honor to open God's word together. So let's, let's pray and let's jump into God's word. I got a lot to share with you today. As always, but I got a lot to share. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the privilege, the honor. Lord, to know you. Lord, as we are connecting, connected, yes, through technology, but more importantly, through your spirit. Holy Spirit, I pray you have complete control in this place. Teach us, correct us, rebuke us. Lord, I pray that whatever is of man may be forgotten, what is of God may be brought to our attention so that we can be the people you've called us to be. What an honor to have your word in a language we understand. So Lord, I pray as we open it, challenge us today to be people who truly live for you each day. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Repetition. Repetition. When something is done and said on a regular occasion so that you don't forget, so that you remember. Repetition. I grew up playing rugby. I love saying that. Real man sport. (laughs) I cannot tell you how many times we had to run plays. You're part, whatever sport you're part, you know this. If you are part of of a team or you play a sport, Repetition. You run the plays. It, it, to the point that it has to become second nature. Why? Because when you're on the field, you want it to come out. That which you practice, that which you remember, that's what you've gone over, will appear in the field. I mean, we started practicing in July so that we prayed, we hoped to get to the final in, in, in March. Repetition. If you're a teacher, if you teach... You're a professor of any sort. Teachers, how many times do you have to say the same thing to your students? Yeah, I told you this last week. I am reminding you what we taught a month ago. We did it yesterday. God bless you, teachers. Thank you. May the Lord bless you. Oh, you got a clap. There we go. Yes. Parents. How many times do you have to say, how many times have I said, what did I say? What? No, 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 I know, I know this was just five minutes ago. But what did I say? If you don't repeat guidelines at home, then we grew up allowing immature children to control the home. And if they control the home, then they think they control everything else. So it's important, parents, to keep repeating it. Keep repeating. Why? Because we forget. Humans forget. God knows this. We forget. So God in his word, you'll see this again and again. Remember, remember, don't forget. Remember, remember, don't forget. To the point, actually, that God institutes, orders, different events, different festivals, different feasts for his people so that they won't forget. The Sabbath rest every week. Remember that you're not God. (laughs) Rest is a gift from God. In the people of, in the Old Testament, what we call the Hebrew scriptures, we call it the Old Testament. You had the Feast of Tabernacles, the Day of Atonement, the Feast of First Fruits, the Passover. Actually today, Our Jewish brothers and sisters and friends, they celebrate Purim, which is from the book of Esther. Don't forget. Remember. Don't forget. Remember. We who follow Christ, he instituted things that we should not forget. Remember. One of them 
is next weekend. As next weekend, we celebrate what we call Easter or Resurrection Weekend. This is what sets Jesus apart. You see, Jesus, yes, died, but if he had stayed there, he would have been like every other religious figure. Like Muhammad and Buddha, like Joseph Smith or Gandhi, like Rod Hubbard or whoever it is. But because Jesus died and rose again, he sets himself apart from all others as the only true and living God. By the way, that should excite you. Because when he lived, there was hundreds of people saw him. When he died and he rose again, the Bible tells us up to 500 people saw him after he was resurrected. He said, touch me, fill me, eat with me. Jesus is alive. Guys, that's why next weekend, oh my goodness, next weekend, come ready to celebrate. Go to whatever campus is closest to you. If, you have, if, if your campus needs an early entry ticket, get it for the service that you're going to. Not for all the services, please. Just for that service. And invite people. You know, you're on Publix or Detweilers and you're going around and you know, I want to invite them. You know, four to five people are prone to say yes to be an invitation to go. Eastern Christmas. The most incredible moment in church, in the church, in world history was the resurrection of our Lord. And next week, we celebrate it every week, but next week is a special week. So I want to encourage you. As we come to that, I want to teach a little bit today. Surprise, surprise. I want to encourage some of you today. Some of you are going to see this for the first time. Some of you are going to see it as a remember or as a refreshment. Why? Because day after day, year after year, week after week, God instituted. Jesus gave us something we call the communion or the breaking of bread or the Eucharist if you have a different church background. In that moment... I taught this a couple of years ago. You don't even remember what you had for breakfast, so you're not going to remember what I taught two years ago. I'm aware of that. But it's the repetition. It's the necessity to, to, because we forget. Because I make myself God. Or I think I'm in control. Or when in the middle of my business and my parenting and my walking and my walk, I actually forget that there is a God and I'm not God. So today I want to encourage you. Maybe teach you for the first time what that is. To do so, I want to go um, to Luke chapter 22. Now, all the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, tell us about this, but I'm going to read some verses out of Luke 22. The whole passage is 1 to 13 and more, but I'm just going to take a few verses out of Luke 22, and this is what it says. Now, the feast of unleavened bread, which is called Passover, was approaching And the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how they might put him, Jesus, to death. For they were afraid of the people. Then came the first day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. And Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare the Passover for us so that we may eat it. The Passover was an event, a feast that the Jewish people did every single year. Jesus was Jewish. The Jewish disciples were Jewish. They were celebrating Passover. In this Passover is where Jesus starts to do something that is completely different that changed how you and I worship Jesus and the Lord. Now, let me set the context for that week because this Sunday is the Sunday we celebrate Palm Sunday. This is the Sunday that when Jesus fulfilled the prophecies of Zechariah, he came into Jerusalem sitting on a donkey. Now, I know after I say that word, all of you are thinking, he sounds like Shrek. (laughs) Donkey. (laughs) So Jesus, as long as you say I sound like him and not look like him, I'm doing okay. Okay. (laughs) He comes into Jerusalem. The palms were set in front of him. A sign of a victorious king shouting Hosanna. The people at the time recognized who he was. The crowds shouted Hosanna. Now, I have taught, I have taught, and many others have taught. Well, the same crowds that that shouted Hosanna on a Sunday crucified him later that week. I I, want to... I want to maybe make you think about something different because 
Well, actually, that passage tells us the religious leaders were not happy with that. They were afraid of the people. They were already making him king. He was coming as a king. He was coming to fulfill Zechariah prophecies and all the other prophecies. And in the middle of the night, they go for Jesus. And the, they put him in, a, in the front of the court in the middle of the night. The people, most of the people, the crowds were sleeping. Jesus was actually on the cross by 9 a.m. Most of the people were just waking up to find, wait a minute, this is the one who was supposed to be king. Why is he crucified? So maybe that wasn't the same crowds. And why did I say that? Because when Jesus did rise from the dead, a few weeks later, when Peter stands in front of a large crowd, filled with the Holy Spirit and all the disciples, we are told that 3,000 came to Jesus that day. Why? Because they recognize him as king, and now they've seen him as a resurrected king. Not as a king that they expected, but a different type of king. So in Palm Sunday, we proclaim him as king. He's a king that's different. He's a king not like you and I think he's supposed to conquer. He come humbly on a donkey to die. So as we look at this, I need to uh, teach a little bit of what the Passover looks like. Because it's impregnated with meaning. So hopefully it will help us when we break bread, we realize, oh my goodness, there's more going on here than just a little bit of bread and a little bit of juice. For my journey on this Passover, it was six years ago that friends of my father-in-law invited us to have Passover. They are Jewish. They celebrate this every single year, Passover. We were invited to be part and participate. Um, they are not, they did not acknowledge Jesus as the Messiah. They did not acknowledge that Jesus is actually the fulfillment of what you will see in a minute. I'm going to teach you. But as I'm sitting there, I'm like, I was invited for a meal. I thought it was a meal. You know, I grew up in Spain. I'm from Ireland. When I sit down, there better be bread and Irish butter together right there. We're going to start like that, okay? And I arrive, and I arrive, and there's like, crackers and they're making me eat some things that are like what what is this and we're reading and the family's involved in reading and asking questions and I'm I'm at that I'm having this moment of like oh my goodness Jesus you're all over this you're actually from year to year reminding them of an event called exodus but it's what you, oh my God. Actually, it impacted me so much that we as a family, since that day, we celebrate Messianic Passover as a family where we gather together, we go through the readings, we pray together. We, it's incredible. We have a meal together. It's actually, it's really a family time. A day set aside for that. So let me get the context and then I'm gonna jump in. Because the context is this. God creates Adam and, Adam and Eve and Adam and Eve disobeyed God's direction. And in doing so, in disobeying, we are infected with sin. We are, the Bible says, we are dead spiritually. We cannot respond to God the way God originally designed us to respond to him. And on that day, God gave a, had to have a sacrifice, death for life. A blood sacrifice of a lamb was given to cover Adam and Eve. As the generations go past, God elects Abraham. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, through them, a people through whom he was going to show the world who this God, who he was. These people, the Hebrew people, end up in slavery. And then the book of Exodus, under the superpower of Egypt, you have seen the movie with Charlton Heston, or you've seen the animation, the, 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 uh, the, the, the story where, where of Moses, and it's incredible, let my people go, interesting that is the event where we see about 10 plagues. Every single one of those plagues, guys, is a god that the Egyptians, who were the superpower at the time, worshipped. So every plague knocks down one of their gods to show they are not really gods. I am God. And the last one, the last one would break pride. And the last one, that last plague would break rebellion, but there was a blood sacrifice. And this is where Passover was instituted. Let, let me read it with you in Exodus 12, 
Exodus 12, again, is a long passage. I'm just taking some verses out of the whole passage. You read it at home. It will bless your heart. God institutes a substitute. And this is what it says. Your lamb, verse 5, we're jumping into verse 5. It says, your lamb shall, we, shall be unblemished male a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, verse 7. Moreover, they shall take some of the blood and put it on the door, two doorposts, and on the lintel of the houses which they are to eat, the sides of the door, the entrance of the home. They shall eat the flesh that same night, roasted with fire, and they shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Then it goes on and gives more direction. Verse 12, for I will go through the land of Egypt, and on that night, I will strike down all the firstborn of the land of Egypt, both male and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I shall execute judgment. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live, and where, when I see the blood, I will pass over you and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. That night, God told Moses and Moses to the people, this is what you're going to do because tomorrow you're going to have freedom. There's going to be an unblemished pure lamb, one-year-old, very specific, that will be slaughtered. The blood will be put on the doors. And when I see the blood... I pass over that home and my justice will not come to that home. My judgment will not come to that home because of the blood. From that moment, they have celebrated Passover, the Seder meal. And I want you to come with me so I can show you what the Seder meal is like. Because in the Seder meal, there's so much going on here that is so fascinating. And I pray it will be an encouragement to you. The justice of God because of the blood. Very important things are happening here. You will gather as a family. On that day, by the way, the ladies would have cleaned the home. Cleaned the home. And they would have removed the home from all yeast. Because yeast was a representation of blood. Oh, sorry, of sin, of sin. So therefore, no yeast. They would have lit a candle. In the lighting of the candle, the lady of the home, the mom of the home, would have lit the candle. And that candle, she would say, God is the light of the world. God has come into, God, God has come into this dark world. And they would have readings. And the leader would read, and then the kids would read, and then someone else would read different passages of Scripture. Let me show you what would have happened in the first half of the Passover. In the Passover bread, this is very important. The matzo bread. Notice there's a little difference. It's unleavened. Why? Because they've already removed the yeast, the leaven from the home. It, it was that bread that was had to be made fast because in the day that they were removed from, they left Egypt. They didn't have time for the bread to last. There was no leaven. And it, notice this. It was pierced. It was stripped and then baked. This is the type of bread that they would have had and they do have from generation every year, every year, remember, 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 repeat, remember. Why? Because you forget. So this matzo bread is what we call the matzo bread. Very important. And I want you to notice the piercing. I want you to notice the strips. Okay. They would have taken the matzo bread and they would have dipped it on different things. Different things that represented different parts. Obviously, I've made this all nicely presented so that you all can see it really nicely. We have four cups or they will drink out of the one cup four times. In that cup, the first one would be the cup of sanctification, rejoicing. The second one, judgment. The third, redemption. And the fourth, praise. We will come to that. You, there's different parts of the, the meal that they would have had. As they go through the readings, they would have gone to, for example, the bitter herbs. The bitter herbs, actually in some homes they use horseradish. Have you ever served a spoonful of horseradish? It creates tears. By the way, when we do this, even with my seven, my eight-year-old, he has to eat it with matzo. And it's not just a dipping. 
take it. You need to taste it. Why? Because that is the, what sin does to you. Disgusting. It's, a, it's connecting memories to tastes to Bible reading. They had the carpus, and the carpus is the, the green leaves, and the green leaves was dipped into um, salty water. Why? Because God was going to bless, but sometimes blessing comes through tears. Not all tears are negative. They would have eaten, they would have read, they would have tasted, they would have remembered of what God had done, bringing them out of physical slavery. For 3,000 years, our friends, our Jewish friends do this every single year. Then you've got the Chalaseth, and I'm not Hebrew, so I'm not saying it right, but this is, this is where it reminds them of the brick and mortar. It's done of like an apple and a cinnamon, so there's a sweet taste to it. And they connect that with the bitter herbs and they eat it together because even though it was hard, it made them who they were. Eating it with the matzo bread. Since then, since they have no temple in, 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 in Israel, the, the bone shank is part of a representation today of the, of the sacrificial lamb, which they don't have. So they have it as a, as a bone. And then the harden of uh, Pharaoh's heart. It's a, um, a boiled egg. So just a symbolic. So they would have the readings. They would go through all of this. They start with a candle. Then they would have the drink. Then they would try. Then they would read. Everybody would be reading. And then they would get to the second cup. The second cup is the plagues. The second cup is the cup of deliverance. And it's interesting. At this point, they would dip their finger and put it on 10 times onto the plates. Why? Because that was a symbol of God liberating them from the plagues. But they didn't want to rejoice in somebody else's hurt. Interesting that, isn't it? I rejoice when somebody, my, my enemies, they hurt. I rejoice. They didn't. They rejoiced, but they did it in a different way. Then they would take and eat, try the different things, and it would come to a point when they would have the meal. At that point, which by the way, could take a while with the reading and the questioning. At that point, then they bring out the lamb and they eat the food and they all eat together and they rejoice. Okay. Somewhere, either at the start of the Passover or in the dinner time, there's this um, sort of container called a masotosh. This is one piece, but it's divided into three different sections. And each section has a, has a matzo bread inside of it. Three in one. One container, but three different sections. Now, uh, uh, Jewish people would say, some would say it's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Some would say it's three different parts of the Jewish. There's so many different rabbinical interpretations of this, okay? But all the tables, since they don't even know, this has been at the table of Passover. The leader goes to the second part. They all do this goes to the second part of the Trinitarian container. He breaks it. He wraps it in linen, which I should have opened that before that. Wraps it in linen. And he hides it somewhere in the house, house behind a pillow. That is a practice that happens either before or during the meal time. They all have their meal. Then comes the part of what they call the afikoman, where the children, or the children really, are encouraged to go and find that which was hidden in linen. And nowadays they give a couple of dollars. When we went... I don't know how much money it was, but I was going looking for it. I'm like, hey, hey, is there money involved here? Come on now, you know? Actually, at home, even my wife is looking for it. You know what I mean? At that moment, after they eat, the kids go find it. They go and remove, roll the pillow away, bring the afikom and bring the piece of bread that was put in linen. They take it, and this is what they break and eat like a dessert. It's the last thing that's left in their mouth. Now, right now, 
If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, every light in your brain should be going off. Why? Because let me tell you something. Three in one. The second one, by the way, let me make it clearer. The Bible teaches us of a God, one God, that in six, exists in three persons. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Son, the middle one, is the one that's removed. It is broken. It's pierced. It's stripped. It's put in linen. It is hidden behind a pillow. And then it is brought back to the table. Okay? Follow me here. Don't forget, don't forget, don't forget, don't forget. Now let's jump in what Jesus does at this moment. Because in 1 Corinthians 11, we are told, Paul tells us, For I received from the Lord that which I delivered to you, the Lord Jesus Christ. On the night he was betrayed, he was celebrating Passover with his disciples. He took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this broken, pierced, stripped, unblemished bread, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This is the Trinitarian, the second part of the Trinitarian package that gets broken, that gets put in linen, that gets hidden, gets brought back, that gets buried and brought back again. I'm taking you somewhere. It's broke. He says, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Jeez, I don't think the disciples understood it at the time. But within 24 hours, the second person of the Trinity was beaten, stripped, pierced, and was buried in linen. The enactment of what Jesus then fulfills is right there. The Passover, thousands of years before, all these prophets, Jesus is now fulfilling, by the way, up to 300 prophecies. I don't know if you realize how exciting this is. In Luke chapter 22. You know why? Because I think I have to save myself. Because I think I have to be in control. Jesus took that bread. He said, this is my body. Look, actually 22 verse 19 says, this is Jesus' own words. And when he had taken some bread, given thanks, he broke it and said to them, this is my body given for you. This do in remembrance of me. See, when we break bread, it's not just a piece of bread, guys. It is. It's symbolic. Yes, a piece of bread. But it's a lot more. The second person of the Trinity that was broken, that was pierced, that was stripped, was hidden. It was brought back. That's the piece he broke up. That's the piece he shared. The Afikoman. Jesus is the Afikoman. He did, they did not take his life. He gave his life. Within 24 hours, he fulfills it. And the next thing they do in the Passover after the Afikoman is drink the third cup. They drink the cup of redemption. Redemption. The act of regaining possession of something in exchange of a payment. The clearing of a debt. As they drink that, they're reminded that God paid for their debt. That God was the one that brought them physical freedom in the book of Exodus. Jesus does this. Verse 20. He says, at the same time, he took the cup after they had eaten. By the way, in 1 Corinthians 11, it was after supper. That's why we know it was this. It was after supper, after supper. He says, this cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. This is the, it's not about a, the blood of a lamb anymore. It's not about a blood of an animal anymore. He told them then, my blood. I, my blood is going to be this sacrificial lamb. And I'm telling you, the disciples probably didn't get it. But after the resurrection... They got it. They understood. 
It was the body that was broken. It was the cup of the new covenant in the, in the Passover. It was after, you see, Jesus was the one that within 24 hours goes to the cross, gives, gives his physical body, gives his blood. But then in the resurrection, he shows his power. I, I, some Jewish historians tell us that in the Passover, as the blood was put on the doorposts, it's like a triangle pointing to where is our help going to come from? Where are we going to get our answers? And in the cross, I love the imagery, where it's in the hands and in the feet, the blood is an arrow pointing downwards where God came to fulfill. God came to save. God was the one that initiated. God is the one that loves. God is the one that saves. It's in God. So that's why when we break bread, it's so important. 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Christ our Passover. It's no longer an animal. God is the one. The second person of the Trinity, which I find absolutely fascinating that they don't even know why this is on the table. But from generation to generation, they've been doing it. They take the second one, they break it, they hide it, they bring it back. That's the Afikoman. That's the cup of redemption. So when you and I take breaking a bread, it's not some flipping thing that we do whatever Sunday. But no, this is to remember what Jesus did for us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28, it says this, A person must examine himself, and in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So before we take this, we are to stop. So if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, guys, I need to tell you what the Bible says. The Bible says you and I have a problem. Spiritually, sin, it affects everything. I'm bent against God. Just look at your children. You don't teach them how to lie. They do it. Religion tells you what you have to do. Clean the outside, clean the outside. Tick, 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 box. The Bible has told us what God has done. Jesus stepped into time and place. So he was God. Unblemished, pure, holy. Voluntarily became the lamb, sacrifice, blood. So that you and I, in accepting Him as the Lord, in recognizing Him as the Lord, we can have forgiveness and purpose and hope. It should weigh, it should impact how I live my life. Not just a token on a weekend. Not just some random Christmas and Easter. Every moment, every time, I represent this King. So what does it do? Well, actually, by the way, at all our campuses, if you're watching at home or you're Get ready to break bread because we're going to do that together as a family. There's a little cups you were given on the way in. Let's get ready, but we are told to first examine ourselves. Because Jesus is the one that paid the price. So we don't want to just walk away and we don't want to just do this in, in, a, in, a, in a casual way. This is, this is a holy moment. This is a remembrance moment. So at your home, go and get a, something, bread and a juice, whatever it is. Get whatever you need. Because at this moment, I want you to remind, remind, remind you of a few things. It's participatory. In other words, everybody's welcome. Everybody is welcome, but it's through Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. It's not through the a church or your church or my or Bayside, it's through Christ. So if you're not a follower of Christ, by the way, I'm going to lead you in a minute of prayer where you, I would love you, I'm begging for you to understand what Christ did for you. But if you still don't believe and you, you're, you're here, I'm so glad you're here, I'm so glad you're watching, but just watch. But for us, your followers of Christ, we're, we're called to participate. This is a reminder. This is a remember. Don't forget, remember what I did for you. Second is a time of self-examination where we ponder, we think, we pause. Are my motives, my actions, my attitudes. It's a place where we ask for forgiveness and we give forgiveness. Jesus said, if you have something against you, or someone has something against you, leave your sacrifice at the altar, go and be reconciled, and then come. In other words, your sacrificial offering of worship and giving is secondary to reconciliation. Yeah, it's okay to come to church, but get yourself right first with others. Because then God can work on the inside. You don't have to clean yourself before you come. It's through Christ. It's through His blood. It's through His body. 
You don't have to take a box. You don't have to try to perform. I don't know how many times people said, oh, I don't want to go to church. I want to burn. What? Church is the place where we proclaim Christ. We're all a bunch of losers anyway. We need Jesus. If it wasn't through Christ, we wouldn't be, what? We're wasting our time. If it wasn't for the resurrection, we would be wasting our time, Paul tells us. It's a place to remember. Don't forget, don't forget, don't forget. It's a place to be thankful. Oh, if this doesn't make you thankful. That is not about performance. It's not about position. It's not about money or education. It's about what Jesus did. It's a place where we realign. Because what, maybe this week, not maybe this week, I know this week, me, I just need to be reminded and readjusted and realigned that what God, you're God, I'm not. You're in charge, I'm not. I just want to follow you. If If you rose from the dead, I'm good with everything else. If you can look after that, you can look after my family, you can look after my business, you can look after everything. I just need to obey you. It's a, it's a place of proclamation, proclamation where we proclaim who Jesus is. By the way, we, we bring in the bread, we eat church, we sanitize this. You know, you all have your reed cups and you all have your little things and it's great. But you know crucifixion. If you've been around an animal being slaughtered, it is messy, it is dirty, it is bloody. Within 24 hours, our Lord Jesus Christ was crucified, was beaten, was pierced, was stripped, was spat at, was was laughed at. He could have called the angels and wiped them all out. He could have gone another way. Actually, Jesus himself said, take this cup upon me, but my, may your will be done, Father. He was obeying. Even Jesus was obeying the Father. Obedience is a great Christ-like quality. In it, we celebrate. We celebrate that our king did die. And that our king did rise. And that our king, the Bible tells us, he's coming back again. And he's not coming back again as a baby in a manger. He's coming back as a king of kings and lord of lords. And every tongue will confess and every knee will bow and will declare that Jesus is lord. So it's a time of celebration. So I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what you're facing physically, emotionally. I don't, uh, relationally, financially. Guys, this is the time. It's going to be okay. Paul says, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. One of my professors used to say, David, we're in the land of the dying, going to the land of the living. So we get the opportunity each day of representing the true king to thank him. So as we prepare to take bread and we, and we prepare to take this as, a, as all the campuses, let's take a few moments to just reflect. Let's take a few moments just to prepare our hearts. Kids, lunch, business, whatever it plans. In light of what you're just going to do, it's nothing. So Holy Spirit, we come before you. As your people, we are so grateful. You may be hearing my voice or you're watching on the man or now and wherever you are, you've never actually asked God to forgive you. You've never actually recognized Jesus as who he is, the son of God who gave his life for you. And you may be saying, well, how do I get right with God? Well, the Bible says if you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord. So in churches, we usually lead you in a simple prayer. Again, I say this every week. <clears throat> there's nothing magical in your, my words, but from your heart to God, there's something really powerful happens. So if you never, you may not have all the boxes tick, you may not understand it all, but the first thing you need to recognize is that Jesus is the Lord, that Jesus is God, that Jesus did pay, that Jesus has done everything he can. And he's welcoming you. How do you say, Dave? Well, this is it. You say, Jesus, forgive me. I recognize that I've been living against you. Forgive me. You be the Lord of my life. I surrender to you. 
Teach me each day to follow you. I believe who you are. I believe what you did. If you pray something like that, I was just guiding you a little bit. If you pray something like that, at that moment, everything changes. At that moment, there's forgiveness that's given. Now it begins the journey that we're all on who follow Jesus or what it means to follow Jesus. So let's take together. Lord, thank you that on the night you were betrayed, you took the bread, you broke it. And you said, this is my body given for you. So Lord, we eat this bread as a symbol of your sacrifice with thankful hearts. Church, let's eat together. And then, Lord, you took it after supper, that cup, the cup of redemption, the cup of the debt that was paid, the buying back what was yours in the first place, the blood of the sacrificial lamb, Lord, thank you. And you said this is a new way to approach you. Lord, not with the blood of an animal that has to be repeated weekly or daily or monthly or yearly, but because of the blood of Jesus Christ. So as we take this cup, we are so humbled by what you have done. We're so thankful. Please, Lord, allow us to live for you each day. Lord, in light of this, especially this week, we eat in remembrance. We drink in remembrance of you. Let's drink together. Father, thank you for your grace and your mercy in our life. Thank you for how the Passover reminds us reveals to us that this is a very important important event where we remember, where we rejoice, where we worship. So Lord, I pray this week you will give us an opportunity to show the love of Christ, to share the love of Christ. And Lord, I pray this week we will never forget what you've done for us. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me and We're going to, guys, in light of this, I'm going to ask you, really, in light of this, in this moment, we're going to sing a song about who Jesus is. This is a moment to worship. Guys, five minutes extra in a parking lot is nothing in comparison to this. So just take your time. Just worship him. Just exalt him. He is the king of kings. He is going to come back. So let's live in light of that each day, in our homes, in our businesses, in our life. Let's live for Christ. Lead us, guys. Thank you.